Kate. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Let's continue the uh, uh, series of uh, discussions of today. And uh, this is um, the window of Europe. Is it Moscow successful in finding common ground with European with foreign architects? I would like to thank all the speakers that are here today, which is quite important uh, speakers that they can talk about European identities, but also Moscow identities, and how we have been able, or you have been able to change drastically the city in the last 10 years. So before starting, I would like to make a short introduction about the topic and about the content in order to be at the same page, everyone. Architecture is a slow discipline in its process that reflects the spirit of our epoch. Theoretically, it should be considered as one of the most humanitarian disciplines because it serves the interest of the civilization. Especially in the last 20 years, everywhere in the world, the market economy represents a dominant force in defining the content of architecture. Architecture promoted by private serves the interest of private clients. In the public realm, we can still find architecture that serves the interest of the citizens. Public realm is managed by the city government and serves the society. Urban regeneration of public spaces should still make the history of the city readable, make understandable the DNA of the city, regenerating the city by understanding its territory. Moscow is a city with an incredible stratification of culture and European influence, and at the same time, it is an inspiration for many international architects. Moscow represents the common ground between Europe and Russian cities. Since the last 10 years, the capital has been witness of international competition and large-scale regeneration projects that gather the attention worldwide. So some general question that is open to the debate is Moscow entered in the international urban agenda with other megalopolis. What is the DNA of this capital? And can Moscow be considered a bridge between Europe and Western countries with European cities, uh, sorry, Russian cities? So I would like to bring these questions to the speakers and um, well, first of all, before starting, because I would like to make a specific question to each one of you and then stimulate a debate, uh, I would like uh, to welcome Mr. Sergei Kuzitsov, the chief architect of Moscow, Mr. Renkolas, founder of OMA, Mr. Yuri Gregorian, director of the Bureau Meganom, Mr. Winnie Mas, founder of MVRDV, Mr. Charles Renfro, partner of Dealers Cofidio Plus Renfro, uh, Mr. Sergei Choban, founder of Speech, and Mrs. Francine Ruben, founder partner of Meccano. So let's start maybe with the chief architect, Sergei Kuzinsov. I have a couple of questions to you regarding the incredible amount of projects that uh, have been designed and implemented and realized in the cooperation with international offices. So you have, oh, now it's better, I hear myself even better. <laughs> so the concept for Zaradia Park was developed on the basis of international competition that, by the way, Strielka can be organized. And the MVRDV has recently announced that they have won a close competition. Skolkovo also organized regular competition as well. So what is your assessment of the outcome of such cooperation? And what do you, which kind of aspect of characteristic uh, or elements would you improve in doing such competition or, uh, well, in the next strategic vision for the city? Development. Okay, I have some slides. Can I uh, show it now? Yes. Presentation, you can put it quickly on the slide. Okay, should I click it myself? Or? Well, I'll try to keep it brief. I'll briefly tell you. We know that uh, our time is limited. 
so when I just started working as chief architect of Moscow, uh, part of the program proposed by Mr. Sibyanin, developing the city through architecture, of course, we understand that uh, the city includes many different elements, but signature architectural objects are, I think, one of the cornerstones shaping the identity of a city. For the people who live here and for international visitors who see the city as a partner in international dialogue. So international architectural competitions getting top architects from all over the world was a priority to us. And this does not only include signature projects. This was also an important element of the program. So our goal, uh, this has been going on for five or six years. I have a few figures here. Actually, we have had dozens of competitions. And uh, the changes that have taken place in Moscow during this period, the facilities that we have built, had a very strong effect on the way the city is perceived, not only by international visitors, and Moscow attracts a lot of visitors from all over the world, but also by people who live here as well. We need to overcome this Soviet period and post-Soviet period of stagnation in architecture. This was very strong in the Soviet Union and later in Russia. Uh, we are lagging behind the rest of the world in architectural developments. Let I'll, I'll go through my slides little by little. Uh, it doesn't exactly follow what I'm saying here, but we'll do this in parallel. I think this was very important. We broke down this metal barrier in the way people see the city they live in. They began to perceive Moscow within the global cultural context. We talked a lot about this in 2016 when we went to Venetia for the Biennale. Uh, we talked about rethinking our Soviet heritage legacy. This is something that belongs to the past and we face the question of what is Moscow identity today and tomorrow? How should Moscow position itself as part of uh, the global political and economic process? Traditionally, we had uh, international architects starting from the 15th century. We know about our Italian architects who helped build the Kremlin. We have always had this, and this has always been criticized. <laughs> so we have this very interesting effect. So on the one hand, we think this is a highly successful practice, and on the other hand, we keep criticizing this phenomenon. This is a very weird phenomenon. So what we need is to achieve visible results, positive results, like Park Zariadi, for example. Uh, when you have something you can touch, you can see with your own eyes, like it's been less than a year, but more than 8 million people have visited Zariatia Park. It attracted a lot of attention from football fans who came here for the World Cup. So uh, it is this kind of projects that silence critics. Uh, we understand that we have a very important place in the global process and it's very important for the people who live here so it's not just my opinion I think this has become a, a universally recognized practice architectural competitions it's not just in Moscow they invite star architects both from abroad and from Russia we also develop Russian architects it's not like we are going to give up our market entirely, but we still need to work with the best bureaus from around the world. And what you see happening is a very good example of that. For example, we have the renovation project happening in Moscow where tearing down old five-story buildings from the Khrushchev period. And we have 
a large architectural competition. We have invited five leading companies to take part in this competition. Uh, this indicates these are some of the projects. So you see some made by foreign architects, which means that this practice has taken roots in Russia. And I feel pretty confident that we'll continue delivering some very good projects, not just for signature places, but also for regular housing uh, neighborhoods. So that's my answer. I actually, I have a slide here on Skolkova. This is how this work got started. But it's, again, the same thing. There are some very interesting solutions there. On the whole, this just illustrates what I said earlier, that we have accumulated a lot of experience of working with international partners. It's not just something on paper. This is what the previous administration had. A lot of attempts to do something, but uh, nothing specific, nothing accomplished. Well, today we have projects we have implemented. Zahi Hadid is doing something for Sberbank in Spolkova. So I think this is very positive uh, uh, experience. Garage, what Zahi Hadid did in Moscow. A lot of positive examples. And this is a great honor to Moscow to do this work. But for international architects, I think this is also a great honor because Moscow is one of the biggest world capitals. So I think it's mutually beneficial for all the parties involved. Thank you. Again, to the uh, practice of competitions that they are becoming common and common and uh, let's see also for the next future what you have in mind. So, Rem, um, I would like to ask you um, the following, that in 2009 you started the Strelka Institute Education and you have been the program director. Your research with the students was based on five paradoxes as one of them was the public space. Since then, almost yeah, 10 years ago, which seems yesterday, by the way, Moscow has been changed significantly with a serious intervention done by Strelka KB with the Maestri to the Urban Renewal Program, and the Moscow government also initiated a series of urban projects. Now, in 2018, with the FIFA World Cup, and many of these projects are finishing, including the place in which we are right now. So I would like to know if you expected that the city would change so drastically in these last nine years when you start the program of Astrielka and when you start the disquisitions about the public spaces and then what are the biggest challenges that according to you the city government has to pass through all these years? Um. To answer your first question, no, I did not at all anticipate the kind of enormous uh, impact uh, that Stroka would have here. Uh, and also, I didn't uh, anticipate at all how uh, kind of Moscow itself uh, would, uh, in a way, become a kind of magnifying machine for uh, architectural thinking. When we uh, started Stroka, there was a need uh, defined by the kind of Russians uh, to uh, enhance Russian uh, education. Uh, and uh, the paradox was, of course, that we came into a kind of uh, a very well educated uh, kind of Russian uh, machinery. Uh, we met many Russians that are, and that was, of course, also my expectation, were extremely talented. Uh, and so I don't think we, we injected something new, but we were m maybe a catalyst for uh, creating self-confidence, uh, not e even kind of realizing that that self-confidence would uh, become, uh, take this uh, flight and, and have this impact. So I'm totally surprised um, and totally impressed. Uh, and if you ask me, what is the you know next consideration or where I would uh, comment? I would comment that uh, what Moscow has now achieved is modernization, uh, is kind of recognition of public space as a key component of the city. 
uh, it has, for that reason, uh, become internationalized. It's clearly a kind of city that can accommodate massive events uh, and, and that is very appealing to tourism. What I think now needs to happen is uh, kind of perhaps the specificity of Moscow, the uniqueness of Moscow, and how to avoid that kind of single model of public space become the universal model for the entire city. Uh, I think Moscow is, if you look carefully, a kind of unique collage of many, many different uh, ideologies, many different architectural styles, many different moments of, uh, on one hand, megalomaniac uh, architecture, on the other hand, uh, kind of really extremely modest uh, architecture. And I think that uh, a greater sense of that uh, richness uh, would benefit the city enormously. Uh, particularly uh, in terms of uh, competing with other cities, not necessarily on the level of statistics, but uh, on the level of a sophisticated relationship uh, with its own past. Yes. Thank you. I will come back to you uh, to ask about your uh, new uh, project that is incoming, the uh, Tretiakov Gallery. Um, well, I continue because I don't know how much time left we have. So, Mr. Yuri Grigorian, so you are known for large-scale projects that include the redesign projects for Moscow urban territories, as well as the redevelopment project on the scale of the whole city. You work actively to find solutions on how you can improve the Zvor Ulitsa, so I mean the Yard Street, and the transformation of the residential periphery into super blocks, super park. So can you apply this experience of the renovation of the city center to the periphery and at the same time maintaining the unique identities of these territories? Thank you. I, yeah. I have to say that we have been working consistently promoting the periphery agenda in Moscow because we believe all the efforts are pretty much concentrated in downtown Moscow. As a result, you have the cult of the downtown the kind of lifestyle you see in the older parts of the city does not help 90% of the city territory. All the efforts of international architects and all the redevelopment programs, all the wonderful things that are happening today, they're all focused in the center. They just maintain uh, the cult of the center. So our projects of um, Moscow the River and uh, Dvor Ulitsa, Yard Street, uh, aim to refocus us, recalibrate our efforts and make us concentrate more on the periphery. What we have is a unique monument, 75% of which can be covered in one day. It's accessible. It's a, it's a typically Soviet city. It's unlike Paris. Uh, in Paris, this index is 25%. So we have a green city we call a super park. And we believe this is the key element of Moscow's identity, maybe the primary element of Moscow's identity, and half of this area will be covered by the renovation project. They will just replace old buildings with new buildings. And our Dvor Ulitsa project is an attempt to find a strategy for redeveloping the periphery. Without such a strategy, we are going to lose our identity to a large degree. If we just replace five-story buildings, old buildings, with 20-story buildings, with new buildings. If we don't bring new programs, non-residential programs to those places, 
we will just perpetuate all the negative elements we have in Moscow's periphery. Uh, it's just people living in large apartment complexes. I think what we need to do today is uh, some. we, uh, local architects, should come up with a clear strategy for developing Moscow as a mega city, maybe just a set of values we should adhere to when picking such a strategy. So, you know, the more often I leave Moscow, the more often I see when I come back that this is one of the most important cities to me personally, for example. And we have things for the entire architectural community to do here. We can preserve uh, our architectural legacy. We shouldn't turn this into a marketing value, into a brand. This work is very important. We're working with the city as an organism. Thank you. Winnie, uh, your studio participated in several competitions in Moscow, and uh, recently it was announced that MVR DV has won the competition for the multifunctional com complex and uh, Sak Sakharov Avenue. So your design, it's, uh, I think, like a provocation aimed at the surrounding urban landscape. So in your point of view, you as a European architect, first European, then architect, that you, we are used to work with the complexity. Our formament is it's used to work with the st stratifications of culture, and of uh, different uh, well, uh, styles. So we bring this as a luggage, as a, as a heritage everywhere around the world. So, and how do you see Moscow in this sense? Is it a conservative in its architectural way of working? And uh, which kind of potential uh, you as a European architect do you see in Moscow urban environment in this context? Can you put on the... Yeah. Let me see if it works. Is this the first slide? Yes. Um, I respond in an indirect manner, of course. Window on Europe, you call this uh, session. And, uh, sorry, uh, Charles, we'll come back to that in a, in a minute. Um, let me think about... Uh, I thought, let me think about Europe a little bit, as we do, more of us. So, it is said that there is a certain chaos, uh, that it is, a, it is said that we're a bit afraid of China in that way. It is said that we leave uh, Europe uh, somehow, and still there, is, uh, there are people that says that Europe doesn't count uh, for anything. So, but on the other hand, it has a specificity which, is, um, uh, which has spatial uh, implications that um, somehow people like. Uh, if you look to the map, you see a kind of splintered community of uh, an enormous amount of cities that are cute and small, that uh, where certain values are happily uh, shared from, say, heritage, history, in that, mo in that moment that uh, most of the planet are here in that way, of greenness, of, I um, mean, every mayor loves this image, eh, to have a castle, to have a park, and to have a, a nice, say, housing that surrounds it. Uh, we all love to walk uh, very much. We um, uh, don't hesitate to make public transport. Uh, we love trams. There are many more trams than any uh, uh, de decade ago in this 10 years uh, to be done. And we love to bike as, uh, as such. So that is uh, somehow an intricate program that leads, if you look to this map of uh, Amsterdam, for instance, but I could do it for everywhere, that these old, cute environments are highly, uh, say, expensive these days and become somehow the, the success of this urbanism that, uh, that is there. And sometimes we forget, then, say, the pieces that a bit surround it. This is not Moscow, this is Berlin, it could be Rotterdam, it could be Amsterdam as such. If this is, and this is a Paris as such. This 90% of um, where this methodology is not applied comes now to, the, to our situation as, as such. 
At the same moment, I can see some kind of transformation in the US where this kind of, say, urbanism that leads basically to dead ends uh, and that is kind of transformed by new enterprises. Or if I take you to Asia, well, um, at the very moment that we are talking about this kind of, say, uh, uh, cities dictated by infrastructure, that cuteness comes in and copycats uh, from, uh, say, from Denmark are actually uh, based now in, uh, in Shanghai. This is an interesting component. That, do we want Europe? Yes or not? And is it, is say, urbanism has not become like an export article? Or, and when does it become so global again that it touches, say, the iconic qualities of the differentiation? So just some thoughts about Seoul, eh? where well, this, in, in the best tradition of what you guys have been doing in New York, so we already uh, we shake hands of making the city much more greener and connected around in a very Asian way in this case, and to, to celebrate, say, at any position, this new greenness in, explored in this arboretum, this library of plants, a new language than in New York, yes, hopefully, because we respect each other and we want to make a, a next step on the city's vocabulary. And, but I would love that this is more than in any places, it's also a place for the night. That is what I learned about Asia, that when, I'm, when we make this kind of 24-hour uh, park, that, I, that it's safe, that it's nice, and you want to be there. So what is next, uh, when, when I suit to this, then this is the situation at this very moment. It's just uh, one hectare, and if I come closer by, then say the success of this kind of uh, elements is so strong that I cannot see my plants anymore. And that what do we do? Fire people are super scared, and, and, and how do we deal with these numbers? That will also come into Zariaje at that moment. So what will be the success of that? And what I'm happy with, that when we did this, then now gradually we can go extend it. The six bridges are coming into it in the coming months. So the next extensions and gardens are there, and I'm really do, I'm, I'm happy with that, that by this kind of say, effect. Can you do that also on buildings, and like in Jakarta, where m most of it looks like that? And somehow, in this case with Jerdy, we try to imagine that this kind of kampongs, these boxes of things that are there, could turn into also a new kind of density, where cuteness or smallness somehow is combined with that incredible energy and, uh, uh, and scale of this kind of environment. So yes, it becomes somehow a kind of export product where it's a t contemporary values seem to be enlightened or, uh, or monumentalized as such in these places. And I end with Moscow for this moment, like I do. And I, I go also to your periphery. I agree with you, Yuri. It is, uh, we need a plan for the bigger Moscow in a kind of, very, let's say, clear and direct way. I take you to Sherpi Morlat for a minute, one of the competitions. And it was a, a, a place, of course, with an historical uh, value as such. What can I contribute, Yuri, to this kind of environment? And I was very happy when I look to this kind of, yeah, what is it? It's a park. It's uh, basically places like that. It has a certain kind of beauty, and uh, what can I, can I then do with that, with this kind of, say, almost ruins that are there? Where our client wanted this, eh? so, and hundreds of them. And could we combine that in that way? Could we, say, overreact? So in a series of steps, we could convince the client in that way, and, say, the city, because I love to, to make some kind of inhabitation of this all to bed in these halls, new kind of series of architects and architecture that could be there, that, this, uh, that could transform gradually this into this kind of, say, overcoming uh, situation that, do, that has a combination of smallness and bigness, intimacy and, uh, uh, and large scale and intensity and greenness and history as such. Is this the proper answer that, uh, that we could face then in our discussion? Is, th is this what we are wishing for? That I think is the discussion of today, how to embed that kind of, say, values, this window of Europe or on Europe that has this kind of, say, possibilities. Um, unfortunately, this, this, or maybe fortunately, it didn't go ahead. Despite the efforts of the city and us, uh, somehow, the, the buildings got in fire and uh, it ended, say, this, uh, this momentum in, the, in this moment. Um, I still want to show it uh, as a kind of, uh, because I think it's a super positive that you would like to talk about it. But yes, we can discuss how European it should be. Well, thank you. So then, what was the approach of your building then in the context? In the case of Sherpi Malot? Yes. 
it was an urban plan, and that's why I wanted to, to show that, because it's not only objects that are important, but to talk about, say, how do they fit or not fit together, and that this incredible, say, juxtaposition that we enlarge with it. So somehow, I think our only what we did is making this message about history, thinking about the scale and, and about how to transform the density into this combination of those. Thank you. Charles. Well, this is not the first panel in which you are participating. Maybe there are some questions uh, again regarding Zariadia Park, but I would say that, um, well, we would like to know uh, something that becomes before the projects. When we won, you won the competition and uh, you were running, I mean, that um, competition, in, do you think that it helps the brief to understand the challenge? of uh, the Moscow of today and the Moscow, what is going, the future motto that it was going to be through this park. So um, first thing I'd say is the brief by Stralka was the best um, competition brief I'd ever read. And in fact, we were in our studio reluctant to join the competition at all given the political climate um, and were encouraged by the, the completeness and thoroughness of the brief. Second, we were um, flabbergasted uh, and sort of just wanted to challenge the whole status quo to see if an American-led consortium could win the competition um, and what that would take and if it was even possible. And so we were actually astounded to have won. But I think that our project, like many of our projects, it tries to start with a close read of its place. Um, we are not from Moscow. We do not know uh, Moscow in a deep way that a resident might. But we can certainly appreciate the fairy tale urbanity of its um, central district. It's the power, the, the power struggle between the church and the state with very little representation of the public. And I think that's what we tried to do with our scheme, was bring a kind of architecture which had a strength, um, an, a uniqueness, um, uh, and stood up to the two power structures that are surrounding the site, but brought in the public as the kind of um, uh, triumphant uh, uh, participant in this architecture. Um, I like to think that we've made a kind of horizontal uh, monument uh, and uh, something that reflects the, the rolling landscapes of domes and uh, cupolas throughout central Moscow. Um, and the flyover, we tried to make an element which had a strength um, that some of the, the towers of the Kremlin have piercing the sky, yet we did that horizontally, piercing a kind of sacred edge uh, of the water. Um, and I'm very happy to, to see that it's become a much loved feature in central Moscow. And so we also wanted to um, bring in landscape, which is local to Moscow, um, and ha have a, a kind of promiscuous relationship between the, the local landscape and the local architecture, and, and make a, a kind of hybrid um, between um, plants that are native uh, and the kind of local architecture, which is also in itself native. So we hope to have bred something that's unique to Moscow, but that also has a strength all its own. Okay. And do you think you can succeed it? Time will tell. Yeah. Architecture is a slow discipline, so we will see in time the uh, effect uh, of yeah. your project. But it seems like already becoming a landmark for the city and probably is becoming even stronger for the new, well, uh, urban spaces redeveloping around, I guess. Well, Sergei. So you are an architect, well, you are originally a Russian architect living between Europe and Russia, no? between Berlin and Moscow. So you have this duality uh, of working and living in two different cities, and would say maybe two different cultures. So I have a couple of questions to you, one regarding mostly uh, about the uh, way of working in the both parts, let's say, if we would divide the two 
continent was, say, Europe and Russia. If it's so, should we say so? Is there any common ground in that sense of practice? And the second is regarding, uh, I would like, uh, a competition uh, that uh, was that uh, Sergei Kuznetsov just mentioned before in his presentation that, uh, that was held in 2017 regarding the housing stock renovation in Moscow. This was renovation. And uh, in Europe, you know how much we care about renovation and how much we are full of cities with strong uh, heritage and, and, well, cultural heritage can be buildings, but public spaces and even deeply rooted in other parts that are not only architecture. So, well, in that competition, your office was, was one of the finalists together with Zahadid, Meganom, Nikan Sikay, etc. And, uh, well, I don't want to talk about the competition itself, but I want to discuss about the word of renovation in the sense that, uh, well, in Latin it means renovate, it means uh, mean doing work with existing and then making something new. In the case of that competition, renovation was mostly tearing down building and some one of them had an architectural relevance. So since this, your professional life is, bit, life is between these two cities and countries, how do you see, how do you think that renovation is in Russia is it understood in the same way as the renovation in Europe? Um, thank you, Giovanna. I, I would <clears throat> uh, propose I answer in Russian, as my colleagues also, because most of the audience is uh, Russian people. Uh, uh, indeed, since it just happened so that for about 30 years I've been living in Germany, since 2003, and since I won at the uh, Moscow City Project, it was a federation tower. I established my own office. Back then it was with Sergei Kuznetsov here in Moscow. And now I'm living and working between the two cities. And I think it is important because in this way I am perceiving what is happening in international architectural space very proactively and um, this conversation that we're having right now the main significance of this talk for me is that international architectural practices are crucially important for building local architecture here in Russia because in this way Russian architects all of us are are a approximating ourselves to what is happening in the world. We can compare ourselves on the backdrop of uh, the international practices in, in contests and competitions. We can compare what we've done, what they've done internationally, what may be, what should be happening in Russia even more. And uh, we can uh, benchmark Russian architecture against the European architecture. And we enrich um, the culture of the city and uh, eventually of the whole country. So this is intersection of two practices for me is the main uh, stimuli, uh, the main driver which I have in my work. And in this regard, of course, this approach to uh, renovation, what has happened in Berlin and what I've been observing uh, when the Germany was unificated and the Berlin was unifi unified and all these construction uh, transformations, I've been eyewitness. And I can say that the approach is similar. It's a very close approach between uh, Berlin and Russia. But again, uh, in Moscow, in view of maybe not so much mistakes, but some developments which have taken place uh, in big European cities, including that of Berlin. Um, biggest, bigger emphasis is placed on competition and contest. Speaking of the five laws for renovation, it's not only about the five laws, but including the five laws for renovation. There was a quite a big uh, international competition announced. Sergey has uh, identified that uh, those international offices which have taken part in the final stage, and I believe that uh, results will be drawn up after this summer break, hopefully in September, we will know about the outcome of this competition. And the fact that the competition was discussed very widely, there was a big public uh, discussion and talks about this competition. It's uh, definitely very positive, and I would say it's one of a kind uh, factor, because if we compare this to Berlin, uh, 
plan of Berlin uh, the plan of developing the center of Berlin had very big public debate, but only one part of this plan was really implemented in the big international competition. You can have a different opinion. It was a post stamp square competition, and they've laid the foundation for rebuilding the center of Berlin uh, from the quarter to quarter construction uh, to uh, limiting um, the height of the buildings. But still, it was about just one territory. The others were not subject to competition. And here, five territories at once are given uh, for the big international competition. It's definitely one of a kind thing. It's a very positive experience from my point of view. But I fully agree with Yuri Grigorian that it's good to have a competition, but it will simply be replacing one houses on another houses, one type of construction to another type. I do not think we'll achieve any, any good mm, and basic result. Of course, in increasing quality of, of spaces and, and, and quality of construction, uh, building the long-term construction, which, which is not subject to be replaced in the next 50 to 60 years, is a very good precondition. And not to lose human scale is very important. Like, instead of five stories, we'll get 20 stories buildings. I do not think the this is what people want, those people who will be living in these areas. And uh, we can have some high-rises landmark and uh, variation in the, in the um, number of the, of the levels and floors. It's very good for human scale. And the second factor, which is very important, is building this attraction point. If all of our museums and concerts, halls and theaters are in downtown, and they're only making it more difficult to get into the city and get out of the city, but the periphery of this city does not have this kind of attraction points. The new so-called bedroom communities will be replaced, will simply replace older be bedroom communities. This is wrong. We have to distribute evenly these cultural hotspots or attraction points, and the most popular should be taken out of the downtown, not to be concentrated in downtown. And I believe that throughout renovation we have to take it into account. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. Uh, Francine, <clears throat> Meccano, your bureau, it works with a lot of public spaces and uh, landscaping projects everywhere, also globally eh, in the world. So you are European as well, so Dutch specifically, as many of you here in the panel. And you are used to work with the harsh weather, not so much here as in Moscow, but kind of. So which elements you can define and then you can export from the way of living European public spaces? And uh, do you think, is there any criteria of comfort uh, of public spaces that they are characterized by, by such extreme weather? Yeah, it can be Moscow or Taiwan, which this tropical weather. And uh, what are the instruments uh, to work with such a climate. In your building and also, I mean, what you create around, I mean, the surrounding, I mean, especially, I mean, I'm thinking about your Taiwan project. Okay. Um, really, maybe you can give me your pointer, if you could just, yes? Uh, I prepared something to tell about this. Um, really, I think for me it's extremely important to connect public buildings with public space. Um, and I always follow this order, people, place, purpose, because the purpose always changes. Um, I really like change, how we are part of a changing society. This was like 40 years ago in the city of Delft, and now it's like that, and I was part of that change. I want to give a big, big compliment to the city of Moscow for the change you made. Maybe it was the last five years, but I am sure it took more years to prepare this. So big congratulations to the city of uh, Moscow. Big congratulations to Charles for making this park. It's so beautiful. But I also want to make a big compliment to Rem Kolhaas, what he did for so many years in this city. And I think your garage project is amazingly beautiful. We did many, many projects, competitions here in Moscow. 
So, and also always integrating the four seasons of Moscow in it. Um, I won't talk about it today because some of these projects are even confidential. But to realize, this is a master planning we did in Shenzhen, that the higher you go, the more attention you have to give on public space and create green areas. This is part of a North Station master planning in Shenzhen. And also to be very much aware, not only of four seasons, if there are four seasons, but also about day and night. How will people use that space? Maybe the most easy example is the project in Taiwan. What I always try to do is to understand a city. This is the harbor city of Taiwan. It's Kaohsiung. I live myself in Rotterdam, it's also a harbor city. It's a very informal city. It's a harbor city. It's dark at six and everybody comes out and sits in the streets. Theater originally is, um, is an outdoor performance. It's part of street life. This is a former military compound and they decided to make it a central park, a municipal park out of it. And I remember coming in there for the very first time I heard barking dogs, I saw barracks, empty barracks, and I saw these banyan trees. And the banyan tree became the inspiration because the tree always tells a little bit softer, but it tells also with something about the earth, about the climate but also how people use the outdoor space in an informal way. It's very, that's what I try to observe, to imagine how people will use the space. But I was also inspired by the formal language of the tree. And going to a performing arts center was for us part of going to the park. So we transformed this banyan tree into a performing arts center. It's a big one. It's a concert hall, it's an opera house, it's a recital hall, and it's a playhouse. We covered it by one roof, like the banyan tree, and in between it's all open space. It's tropical space. The wind can blow through it. And where the roof touches the park, it becomes the open air theater. And the idea was very much because it's a city that loves light. So the changing, and it's, as I told you, at six it's dark, the changing of the light became part of our, what we call the Banyan Plaza. We also had to realize the building, and we had no clue exactly how to make it in this tropical climate. And then we tried to make it with the local shipbuilding industry, because to connect a public building to the local population is extremely important. And we wanted to make it like a cargo ship. We also didn't have the money as a luxury yacht, that, that, that budget, but really like a cargo ship, that the people, the local people felt it was their building on the land, their ship building on the land. So it's nice, it's based on the local banyan tree and it's made by the local ship building. It's very nice for a public building. It fits, it's a huge building, but it fits in the scale of the park. This is a picture we made uh, during construction. And here you see how it's made. It has light, it's Banyan Plaza, like in Rome, yeah, with the, um, sky, um, the sky wells to create dramatic lights. But in the evening, we, de de we divined these um, chandeliers that can change the color. So it's really a new public, tropical new public space in Taiwan, but of course it only is possible in, in tropical climate. It would not fit here in, in uh, but it's also an acoustic landscape. People can perform here wherever they play. To combine, yeah, I think, a public space, the informal with the formal is extremely important. You go in the building, I show you quickly, it's this hall, it's the concert hall. Um, very organic, double organ, like bamboo trees. And this is the recital hall with calder-like um, acoustic panels. 
okay, we then go out because it's a public space. What is also important is that, in, I hate these buildings that are climatized, Ooh, you get it very cold and then you get into a hot climate. So this in-between public space makes also to adjust your body. And here how it's by night, and this is a little movie. Oh, sorry. Maybe start this one. Okay, start this one. I don't know how it The building is not open yet. It will be opened in October. So you see it's only empty now. So for me, public building, public space for the local people is extremely important. Thank you. And what you, which kind of um, elements would you take from your project in Taiwan with that such conditions? To hear, is there any common ground in that sense? Um, the common no, ground please. is, I think, it's most important is your attitude as an architect. Uh, I remember making also um, plans here in Moscow. We always played with the how to deal, how it works in the winter time. And of course, we are from Netherlands. We like to skate, <laughs> so we try to do that. But it's also depending on. Uh, yeah, yeah, how to work with the four seasons, but also what people like here, uh, what they like to do. But in a way, I was amazed already walking in the Gorky Park and see that also yoga and Tai Chi is also getting here. It's getting all over the world. And uh, so to have a look at it and all these performances. So there is, um, of course, the climate is different, but there are many issues you can uh, use, also by observing. Okay, thank you. Well, now let's talk about the future of the in incoming project. So, Rem, I would like to ask you that you made a garage museum, which is an extremely success and a beautiful building. And uh, well, and now OMA has the commission for the new Tretiakov Gallery. So, what are the challenges of your project? And for the Moscow, for the Moscow city, yeah, for your project and for the Moscow as well, regarding the creation, can we say that of a new line of public spaces that links Gorky Park, New Tretikakov Gallery, and Zaradia Park? Um, I, I think it's, it's important to say that, uh, in a certain way, we we are very privileged. Uh, because we were able to uh, identify two times in Moscow a kind of situation where we said uh, rather than do something completely new and completely our own, uh, we think that both in the case of the garage, which was a restaurant, and in the case of the church of which is a museum, that there is something there that is worth maintaining. And uh, Yuri kind of reminded me that you know, in, in the Russian case, that is typically controversial, and the typical kind of response is to destroy the building and perhaps to rebuild it. Uh, but what we were able to do, and which I think, uh, as I said, we are privileged, we were able to actually maintain 
qualities that were already there. And um, for that reason, I think uh, we were given and were able to exploit uh, pre-existing qualities in the city and therefore didn't have to worry about uh, character uh, or about uh, uniqueness or about uh, authenticity. Uh, given this kind of situation, I think that uh, what we need to do now is, and we is kind of really a coalition, perhaps both of cultural institutions and of architects, uh, to find a kind of more uh, kind of refined way of connecting these uh, entities. Uh, I think there is a kind of no site in the world that I know that has so many am amazing ingredients on such a small site, relatively speaking, that has the kind of river running through it. And I think that uh, in, in addition to all the technological, technocratic, uh, kind of political discourse that uh, uh, Russia and Moscow now develop, uh, it could be a really um, extremely interesting experiment to uh, insist on culture, uh, to insist on a certain fragility of a uh, kind of situation, uh, and, and to uh, work with enhancing uh, things that are already there and, and trying to kind of project them into the future. So you see these uh, axes coming true, and also is I, I don't know whether it should be an axis, uh, but I know that uh, there is no place in the world which has so many, such a density, not a physical density, but a density of kind of events, a density of uh, history, a density in general, and it would be uh, extremely uh, rewarding, I think, to find uh, a new kind of charged, creative and imaginary, imaginative public space that can accommodate that. Yeah. And you, Sergei, what do you think about that as a city of Moscow? No, действительно, тут... Right. Uh, we see a very interesting series of venues here. Actually, we'll have a session later today where we are going to talk about this, how important it is to have a concentration of cultural objects and public places, uh, how important to have it cluster-based. And what Sergei Chobin and Yuri Grigorian said about the periphery is also very important, of course, but still, still, nevertheless, the things that are happening in downtown Moscow today, in an extended sense, including Gorky Park and the new Tretyakov Gallery, uh, Zaryady Park, and you can go further to Polytechnical Museum. Uh, we had an act architectural competition for that as well and they are now working on it as well. So I think this is a pretty much global standard practice. This is what many mega cities do. For example, in Hong Kong, this is what they do in Western Kulung. The city creates new area and they create this kind of uh, series of venues, uh, this kind of cluster. And uh, we should do the same in Moscow, I think. It's good that this is happening. It's not coincidental. It's just happy coincidence that we have all those elements together here in Moscow. It's just a happy coincidence. Okay, so see probably the next development along these two, as you say also, Rem, there are different very important elements close together around uh, along the sea, the, the, the river, and then you can, well, I mean, maybe... Они уже, okay. Yeah, they are already there. They are already connected in a very dense way. But speaking of the future, now we have this plan. We have been talking about this for a long time, but we were unable to implement this project. We would like to have a pedestrian bridge overpass over the Moscow River. But uh, with the Rancipiana, there is another important international star we are working with, with the, the Michelson Foundation. Basically, this is also part of the future development. Uh, this uh, will contribute to this powerful axis of public spaces in Moscow. It's an 
this bridge will be an important element of this cluster. We have the Patriarchy Bridge. This, uh, the, this is another important element. So this will be another addition to this cluster of public spaces in Moscow. Uh, so we still have five minutes. I would like to ask to Yuri, Charles, and Sergei Choban. So a, a, a question like both all of you, you are, you are both of you are Russian architects working uh, internationally, and then you are American architect here working in, in Moscow. And well, um, Russian opened the door to international architects to the cooperation. And uh, do you think uh, you as a Russian architect, for one side, Yuri and Sergei, do you think that the uh, United States and Europe opened the door also to Russian architects abroad? And if it's so, how? What is the aim of this collaboration? If you want me to start, OK. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief. I think it's important to say that uh, we are always focused on this city, its values, its architecture, its architectural culture. And in recent years, I cannot draw a line between Russian architects, international architects, and especially older architects and younger architects. You know, people tend to divide architects this way. I don't think it's fair. To me, many of the architects who belong to the older generation, they look much younger to me than some of our young architects who uh, serve the interests of developers, mostly. Our experience in uh, New York City has been very positive. We love this city and we do our best to come up with some interesting solutions for New York. So as long as you keep architecture as your number one priority, you will never see a city as a marketing asset, as a way to make money. Because we as architects, we have a different perspective. So I just I would stay away from this kind of terminology. I'm very happy that Moscow has projects done by good architects. It doesn't really matter if they come from the Netherlands, America, or Russia. Well, I certainly think it is very important for every country to develop its national architecture. For example, in Germany or in America, they uh, give priority to the national architectural school. And I think Russia also has the same priority. But. When you have international teams from different countries, from different cultures, this is pretty important as well, because you can compare the levels of different teams. And also this brings in some new ideas, new trends, new concepts from around the world. And you get a better picture of the situation you face, for example, here in Russia. You can see things in a new way. For example, I was pleasantly surprised and I was impressed with the project that Rem Kolhas did with the garage. Uh, this was legacy, a cafe from the 1970s. Nobody thought of this as legacy, as anything positive. And this became a very important and interesting part of the city. Any European city, including Moscow, uh, is interesting because of its strata. It's not just like you replace one layer with another, you, and then this uh, idea of destruction goes on to the next generation and so on. We have to be very careful with the things of the past and we should bring the past culture into the new buildings and then 
our current culture will also not disappear. Of course, we tear down a lot of buildings, including some interesting ones, sometimes very interesting. So it's important to preserve this layer, preserve these strata. But it is also very important to implement projects which uh, come as a result of a competition. For example, we are here in Zaryadye Park. We are here in the concert hall. Five years ago, we had an international competition here. And in five years, we have a very good quality venue here. Uh, Sergey, the organizers, architects, the authors of the concept, they all did a very good job. And uh, it's great that they implemented this project to completion. Otherwise, it makes no sense to have a competition. You can have competition, come up with nice pictures, but you need to be able to see the final result. When we talk about architecture, we need something you can see, you can feel, you can touch, you can smell. This is what makes architecture very different from other virtual activities. And uh, there are two projects I want to mention. As an architect, I would like to mention we worked with Massimiliano Fuxis. We won the competition for the Polytechnical Institute. And I hope this project will be implemented, but the speed we are able to proceed at is much slower than um, the speed with um, Zaryadi Park. And it's a pity because when you have this kind of huge competition, you have wonderful. Architects participating, Mikana was also involved, and then you have a winner and nothing happens after that. That's a shame. You need to implement such projects, or you should consider from the very beginning whether this project can be implemented. And project number two, it's also very interesting. I really hope we'll be able to implement it. This is Hermitage 21 project. It's currently being reviewed, and there is a good prospect of getting a positive review. So we really hope this project, as part of uh, Mr. Grigorian's master plan for ZIL, will be eventually implemented. And on younger architects, I don't quite agree with Yuri that it doesn't really matter whether an architect is young or old. I think that we older architects should help our young people. Uh, we should help our young people. We should not uh, get them we should help them not to get stuck in this investment philosophy or for the lack of a better term and get to a level of proper architecture and participation of international architects when you get our younger architects involved in international competitions where standards are very high i think this is a very positive uh thing last year i came up with an initiative of uh, uh, be an ally for young architects up to 35 years old and there were some wonderful Russian colleagues for example Alexander Tsimalu is here in the audience he was well on one of um, he was on the jury there and we had some prominent international architects there for our younger architects this was serious motivation so after this Biennale they got 12 orders in different cities of Russia 12 projects. Many of them are quite interesting. Interesting architectural project, not just standard developer stuff. So this is a very good way to help our younger architects, getting them involved in uh, international competitions, projects like Strelko, Marsh. This really motivates our younger architects. So I think this is really important. We shouldn't neglect that. just would like to say it doesn't matter whether we're uh, from here or there, we're all working globally and the world is not getting uh, to be, uh, um, the, the, the risk is the world is becoming a more divided place when we should be striving to be, to make it more integrated. We need to be designing spaces 
of equity that include everyone, that think about everyone, and that are um, inclusive and, and open and democratic. Sure, we hope so. We hope so also that uh, while well, all these Russian new generations of architects will be able to work abroad internationally because they acquired an incredible knowledge also would, after and thanks all this project has been developed uh, especially in the last 10 years as we said. Well the last question, do we have still time? One minute, okay. Well, Can you, Winnie and, and Francine, maybe Rem, but I don't know, <laughs> 30 seconds each. So say, I mean, you're, all of you work globally but um, is there any specific uniqueness in Russia that you cannot find anywhere else? I mean, you, Rem, you said they are very, have been, well, working with, the, in a very specific context with, the, and you were very lucky to work with the, such projects that have a, also an incredible meaning for the city as well. So, but is there any specificity that you can find in Russia and in Moscow especially and nowhere else? Um, I, I don't want to talk about Russia as a whole because it's uh, way too big. Uh, awesome. But uh, what has struck me the first time when I came to Moscow is uh, the tolerance for the coexistence of a number of things that were uh, completely unrelated to each other. Uh, in other words, there were kind of tiny little constructivist uh, butterflies and there were enormous kind of Stalinist uh, towers and there were uh, uh, neoclassical kind of boulevards and there were uh, uh, gothic churches and there was a fortress and what I think is kind of really amazing about Moscow is how uh, all of these totally heterogeneous uh, entities coexist and create uh, a new uh, entity. And that kind of really, on the one hand, brutal, but on the other hand, aesthetically, unbelievably energetic and rich quality is for me the unique quality of Moscow. What I would like to add <coughs> is that I am incredibly impressed already since 10 years with um, the, the intellectualism that is in, uh, but within the architectural community and in the art community. Somehow to do, uh, with, there's no other place somehow that I feel where I'm in a positively way attacked when I'm working on it. And, and, uh, that, uh, and I sense that in the work of the, of the Russian architects and in the Russian critics. And uh, that inspires me also. It creates a, 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 an enormous, say, um, I have to respond to that every time that I'm here, and I appreciate that. And for me, I think Moscow is a unique city. It's really, maybe the whole country is really about scale and dealing with scale. It's amazing scales. Also this tradition of that it was a city of factories, and at the same time, such a green city. And I agree, it's like the very, very rich cultural tradition of uh, Russia in music, in uh, writers, all the whole intellectual part is, you can be uh, uh, extremely proud of it. It's a unique city. Thank you very much. I think the time is over. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for being part of this panel. And uh, let's follow the next one. Thank you. Thank you.